My name is Erin Gideas. I'm the director of the Office of Civil Rights and Investigations. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our office in just a moment, but I want Corey to take a moment to introduce herself as well. Hello, everyone. I'm Corey Damron. I am the program coordinator for our violence prevention programs, which is housed in our dean of students' office. So I do a lot in terms of awareness and prevention of all the issues we're going to be talking about today. And on the back, you'll see a flyer for our Katie Benoit Campus Safety Awareness Month. I do a lot of programming during the month of September. A lot of things for faculty and staff, as well as students, and you constitute both of those. So you should really check them out, and I'm really excited to Excellent. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So there's a lot of clicking to get through this. So um, OCRI is what we call the Office of Civil Rights Investigations, is responsible for kind of in looking into or addressing issues of discrimination or harassment based on a protected class or status, race, religion, disability, veteran status, ethnicity. The big one we're going to talk about today is sex and gender, right? And so that's what sexual harassment really covers. I view our role as two, twofold. One is to educate what we're doing today, as well as um, when we go to the Katie Benoit Safety Forum, when we do tabling events, all of those things, because the idea is that the more we do on that educate side, and hopefully the less we do on that second side, which is the investigate, right? We want to minimize as much as we do. We have to do that. So that being said, those issues do come up, and our, our office is charged with investigating those situations when they do come up. And so we want you to know that we are a resource here for you. Um, if you ever are uh, responsible for a class and you're not going to be able to make it, you don't have to cancel. Either Corey or myself would be happy to come in and do a conversation with your students because the more we can get this information out there and educate people, hopefully the less we have on the investigation side. So we're going to be covering a lot of ground today with the intent that you leave with an understanding of the University of Idaho sexual harassment policies as well as are educated on gender-based harassment, relationship violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Um, you're also going to learn about your role in supporting our efforts, which we've already briefly touched on. It's important to know self-care. We're going to be talking about some heavy topics today, and we want to make sure that you take care of yourselves in this moment, whether you need to take a step out, go to the bathroom, go get a drink of water, whatever it is you need to take care, do to take care of yourself in this moment, please do it. You also might get a disclosure from a student in the future, and that might bring up a distressing time in your own life. So make sure that you're taking care of yourself in that moment as well. All of the support resources that we talk about today, they're not only here for the students that you work with, but they're here for you as well. So don't be afraid to use those resources when you need them. This includes like free counseling sessions through our Counseling and Testing Center, as well as through the Employee Assistance Program as an employee. So take advantage of these as you need them. You get both, here, here. so. Yes. Best of both worlds. All right, so I'm going to briefly talk about Title IX. Um, I, I used to ask this question, so I've been doing a version of, of some sort of sexual harassment training for quite a while, and I used to ask this question, and um, I'd ask, like, okay, how many people have heard of Title IX? And, like, maybe a quarter, maybe a half of a room would raise their hand if I was lucky. Um, and now when I ask the question, it's like 95% of people raise their hands. And so I stopped asking the question because most of you have heard of Title IX. Um, and this is really the very basic language around it. Um, it's, but really what I always like to cover is that this is so much broader than what we're going to talk about today. We're focused on sexual harassment. Um, which includes sexual assault, stalking, dating, and domestic violence, but it is much broader. Any sort of program that we have, when we have do Lionel Hampton Jazz Fest, all of our programs have to be free of, of sex-based discrimination. Um, any sort of camp that we bring onto campus, whether it's FFA or 4-H or anything like that, everything, pregnancy and parenting fall under this category. Lots of things fit within, our, within Title IX. And so while we're narrowly focused, I always just like to make a point that it is much broader and we're not going to concentrate on that. But please know we are here to support you. If any other questions outside of that focus, of our focus today, comes up. So for our narrow focus, what Title IX needs for you is that you are a mandatory reporter. So particularly when it comes to things like um, sexual violence, gender-based harassment, 
The State Board of Education has said that all employees must report this information. And not only that, they put a time frame on it. They said you have to do it within 24 hours. Um, my guess is that nobody in here is going to meet the exception as being a licensed medical professional or counselor. If you think you do, uh, we will chat later. <laughs> and you, I will, my information is on the back table, um, and we can talk about that. But chances are nobody in here meets that exception. The, so this means you have to report within 24 hours when you learn of some sort of sexual harassment, sexual assault, stalking, whatever it might be. I always like to also caveat this with, you, I expect you to be human beings, and I will return the same favor. So if you are one of those people that can practice amazing work-life balance, and you don't check your email after five on a Friday, and you come in on Monday, and you're like, I didn't see anything over the weekend, but Friday at 5.01, I got an email of a student disclosing a sexual assault, and that's why they won't be in class, and I didn't disclose it all weekend. I understand. Right? I expect you to be human and have those balances. If you're doing field work, you're in a location where you don't have service, you don't have internet access, my expectation is that you do it as soon as practical, right? As soon as you're able to get back to that location and have that service. So just know that it is 24 hours. Um, I'm not responsible for um, you know, uh, you know, disciplining you for failure to do that. My goal is really just that you get it to me as soon as possible. Um, and i that's all I really care about, and I, I don't care if I get multiples. The other thing that I always like to highlight, some of you are um, of an age where you're coming right out of undergrad, you're coming into this, this particular program and this role, um, you're close in age to your students. You're also going to be building, you're in a unique position. We're also going to be building relationships with your mentors, your, your supervisors, your uh, professors, whatever that might look like. We have a consensual romantic relationship policy. And the reason I bring this up is because it is important to be very crystal clear about what it says and what it means. It, believe it or not, doesn't say you can't have a relationship with a supervisor or a supervisee. But what it does say is if you do, you have to disclose it, and we have to remove the authority that exists between the two parties. My advice is unlike Nike, just don't do it. Okay? <laughs> just avoid it altogether, because what ends up happening in some cases is you don't know whether or not somebody is engaging in that relationship because they feel like they have to in order to get a good grade or to get an opportunity, right? It doesn't prevent a sexual harassment claim com from coming forward in the future. So, again, the policy, I'm gonna be very transparent, doesn't <clears throat> say don't do it, but I'm gonna tell you to be uh, avoided, when and all, at all possible, because it, it can create other complications that are really gonna mess with your experience, and again, my goal is to minimize the investigation side. Oh, I, I covered that. I got ahead of myself. My bad. No, that's fine. So we also have a, um, we have a little complexity. I'm going to cover briefly um, kind of what this looks like, but you don't have to know the nuances. So big thing to know, we have kind of two sexual harassment policies. One that is considered the Title IX sexual harassment policy, this is 6100. This is where you're going to find the definitions of sexual assault, stalking, dating violence, domestic violence, um, and sexual harassment. It has to meet very specific criteria, and you do not need to know those criteria. You just need to know if it kind of looks or it might seem like that to report it. The other policy, we can go to the next one, is also sexual harassment, but non-Title IX. So those things that don't meet that specific Title IX criteria might fall under this policy. And that's why I say you don't need to know all the nuances. That's my job. Um, but I do need you to know that there are multiple multiple policies that cover this and that your obligation to report things is applicable to both. So let's talk about what is sexual harassment, what does it look like. Um, this concept of intent versus impact is important. Can you click one more? And I always like to pull up a photo of the office, and because it is still resonating, thank, thank goodness, because I love the office in terms of what not to do in the workplace. 
Um, and if you haven't seen it, that's okay. Just, just you, you've probably seen uh, similar memes, but ultimately, Michael Scott is a great example of what not to do in the workplace. When we talk about intent versus impact, Michael Scott's intent is really never to be malicious, very rarely, right? His intent is to be humorous and funny and all of those great things. But the reality is the impact that it has on people is it makes them uncomfortable. <laughs> it makes them really maybe embarrassed. Um, all of those things start to come out. So we want to think about how the impact we have, the actions that we take, the things that we say, is the impact that it has on the other person, not our intent. Um, and so you kind of see some of the differences, really, we're looking at intention, you know, it, it, when it's not sexual harassment, it's, it's based on equality, it's reciprocal, it feels good, versus the um, sexual harassment is usually one-sided, has the potential to be degrading, um, really might be traumatizing, and overall, the big category is unwanted, right? Somebody does not want that behavior. All right, so sexual harassment can look a lot of different ways. Um, verbal or written. Uh, this could be, uh, you might get a, an inappropriate note. Um, it might be an inappropriate comment. Um, comments about clothing your body, sexual jokes, even spreading rumors. This one gets tricky. Um, folks don't think about um, the impact that spreading rumors have on the environment, and that can potentially fall under sexual harassment. Physical sexual harassment is going to be things that might be uh, blocking someone's exit from a particular space. Um, it might be any sort of unwanted touching, um, something as, as clear as sexual assault, but maybe even something as unclear as like hair petting, back stroking, that sort of thing might fall under this category. Nonverbal conduct. I always like to tell folks, we have a very vast language for a reason. There's a difference, and I'm gonna, Corey, I'm sorry, this is the first time you and I are doing this together, but you are gonna be my sample. Um, Emily is used to this. Um, <laughs> but there's a difference between a look and a leer, right? When I look at Corey and I'm having a conversation, that's different from my elevator eyes or something that might get to the point where it's uncomfortable, right? Thank you for being my um, guinea pig. <laughs> um, similarly, when we talk about that verbal or written, one thing that I always like to mention is there's a difference between like, hey, Corey, that's a really great, great sweater you're wearing today versus it's a really nice sweater holds your body really well. <laughs> that sort of thing is going to be super uncomfortable, right? I just, Corey didn't know I was going to do this, so I apologize. But it, it, you can tell the difference in the language, the tone, the intent, right? Like, again, the intent doesn't matter, but that impact on her is going to is gonna make the big difference. Visual, oh wait, oh, oh sorry, I, I know, I know. I keep, I just talk so much. Okay. Visual displays. If you are... I just like the thing that I like to tell people is like your screensavers, if you have a shared cubicle or space or anything that anybody else can see, third parties who can see that might be able to file a complaint, right? And so your vacation to a nude beach where you created a calendar to commemorate your, your memories, keep that at home. Don't bring it into the workplace. And then as always, if you see something, say something. Bring it up. We want to know about it. Not everything is going to rise to that level, but it certainly creates an opportunity for an educational conversation on the impacts that it's having on the work or the educational environment. Now, so this can really occur anywhere. We often like to think that sexual harassment is specific to the campus borders and within, you know, the, the boundary line, but it can happen anywhere. If you are traveling for a conference, if you receive an email, um, anything that might be tied to your work environment might fall within that category, or your educational environment. And again, you're all in a unique position because you happen to be potentially both students and employees. So you're particularly going to see both sides of that coin. But it really, the location is, is typically irrelevant. It's the context in which it's occurring. And then it can really occur by anybody. Obviously, we think of the more typical dynamics of, um, you know, professor and student, um, but it could be uh, our alums, could be visitors, 
any third parties that come to our campus, so when we have big homecoming events, things like that, might fit within this category. Really, our responsibility to you as the institution is to ensure that these things don't happen regardless of who's engaging in the behavior. Um, our responses may be limited in how we can do that, but we still have options to support people. We also have a retaliation policy, and this is a big one to highlight because we want people to report and we want people to feel comfortable reporting when things come up. So knowing that if there are any sort of threats or harassment or intimidation for filing a report, for participating in a report, we want to know about it because we want to be able to address it as soon as we possibly can. Um, you might find that you don't have a personal experience, you don't have something that you're being reported, but maybe you were a witness to something. So, so my, myself or somebody from my office might reach out to you and go, hey, we want to talk to you, you're not in trouble, um, we just want to understand what you, what you understand. And if you experience any sort of decrease in grades or ostracization or something like that after the fact, we want to know. Um, we might be able to address it in the moment. It might result in a more lengthy second investigation um, into retaliation, but again, those are things that we want to be able to address. So, we want to talk through a couple of scenarios, and we're going to give you some time to, uh, maybe a minute amongst yourselves to, to talk through it. So, um, I'm sticking with my office theme. Uh, so, Phyllis is leading a class discussion for History 302, and several of her classmates uh, have made sexually suggestive <coughs> remarks while pointing and leering, let's use that same word, at her chest. So, I want you to turn to your group nearest to you. If there's two people, you can make four people, whatever makes sense, turn around, talk to each other, and t spend a minute. Do you think this is sexual harassment? What do you think it has, what do you think it is? Tell, uh, so take a minute and talk through it. And go. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm like in the middle right now. Because it's hard to know like what is going on in someone's brain, you know? Yeah, like if they actually mess with that. Yeah, yeah, it's so... It uh, can be a something to... Uh, I don't know. Alright. Yeah. 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 Oh, that was wonderful. I didn't even have to use my camp trick. Can I say that? But we'll save that for next time. Um, okay. So, let me, before we go and kind of see the, the answer, which I'll be clear is not really a solid answer, but... Um, Anybody want to volunteer? What did your group discuss? What did you think? And I can also call on people, which is fine too. So, make awkward eye contact. Yes. So, um, yeah, uh, was sexual harassment. Um, one of the things we were just talking about was, you know, as if it was Phyllis leading the class discussion, um, like, so I, I, from, from an instructor point of view, you know, let's say, what, what, what's the best thing to do? Do you kind of not out him but, or talk about it, or would we still contact you and instead have you come in and, and, and address the situation, or how, how, how should we proceed, I guess, in that situation? Love it. That's a great question. So I think you answered pretty well. Yes. I mean, we have yes on that answer slide, which, by the way, another scenario. Yes, go to it. Sorry. <laughs> um, it says scenario two. I lied. That's a typo on my part. Um, but yes, right? We it, it has the potential to be sexual harassment. What... I'm going to want to know and why I'm going to want you to report is because maybe this isn't the first time this has happened in this class. Maybe this is not the first time this has happened with the students engaging in the behavior. Maybe I have other information that demonstrates this is a potential problem that crosses that threshold into sexual harassment that I need to investigate. So I'm going to want you to know. As far as addressing it, I think there's a couple of things you can do. And it's really going to be, I think, to some extent, your comfort level and your ability to, your, your how the classroom tenor is and your management practice in a classroom. It could be something as, that's not appropriate. If I hear it again, I'm going to ask you to leave. Be as direct as that. 
It could be also something where if you have the opportunity to go and, and kind of get down and go, hey, I want you to be aware that I can hear what you're saying and it's not appropriate, please knock it off, right? It can be something as simple as that. It can also be if it's happening at the tail end, you don't have an opportunity to address, having them hang back after class. It could also be something where you ask me to, hey, come in, and I, I want to spend uh, a 15, 20 minutes at the beginning of my next session talking through sexual harassment on campus, what it looks like, and I can use some of those examples to make specific conversations and, and talk about those things. I think there's a lot of different ways to address it. There isn't one wrong way or right way, but to some extent, it's your comfort level. I don't know if that helps you at all, but excellent. Okay, so we're gonna do another quick scenario. I want you to, again, talk to your group. So Ryan is a work-study student with the art department. His boss pesters him for dates. He turns them down, but they continue to ask him out, making it uncomfortable for him to come to work. So take just a minute and talk to your neighbors. Do you think this is sexual harassment? Tell me what you think. Go. Yeah, it is. All right, let's bring it back. Okay. Can you all hear? Oh, because it's not high enough. How about this? <laughs> We're good. <laughs> We're going to make it work. Okay. So, uh, who would like to volunteer and tell me what they think? Yes, no, maybe so. Back, yes. Definitely yes. Uh, somehow or other, the student needs to talk to somebody about the boss. I'm not sure how we in that situation do anything, right? Because we're already in the building. Um, so that's what we discuss. Okay, love it. Yes, so you, I mean, think about it again. You have two perspectives. You might be the villain. You might also be an observer. You might also be the person, you might be Ryan too. This has a potential depending on what role you're in at that moment. Um, for obviously yourself, if you're engaging in poor behavior, um, I would love you to report your poor behavior, but certainly I'm obligated to. Um, but in terms of, of, of observing it or experiencing it, experience it again. You don't have to report your experiences. That's up to you and that's a personal choice you make. But if you're observing this behavior, you have an obligation under our, our state board policy to report it to me as the Title IX coordinator. So, any sort of repeated, unwanted contact like that, persistently asking folks out, even if it's like, uh, hey, I know you said you were washing your hair last Friday, but you ready? Ready to do it this weekend? No, I told you. I think I stopped asking me. I am not interested. Those can still reach that, that, that level of sexual harassment. So I think, yes, you may be the villain, and you don't have that obligation to self-report, but even if you observe those behaviors in colleagues, um, in peers, those are still things that we want you to be paying attention to and aware of. So we do want to talk a little bit about gender-based harassment. So far what we've talked about is sexual harassment, which are the things that are sexual in nature. Gender-based harassment are things that, are, that can be non-sexual in nature. Comments like a woman's place is in the kitchen, or things that are related to sexual orientation that's so gay. Those sorts of things over a period of time and persistent behaviors might reach that level of sexual harassment. So we want to make sure that 
we're being thoughtful about how we engage in our workplace, in our classrooms, um, because all of these things might reach that gender-based harassment threshold as well. So what I want you to do is, we're going to make you break into your groups again, but I want you to think about what might this look in your workplace? So you're all coming from different fields, different areas. What might gender-based harassment look like, and what might be your reaction to that? So go ahead and take a minute and discuss. I think that happened a lot. Yeah, Before the light, it was not like that. Obvious, not aware. Yeah. Later, it's like everything is like. tell us what you all discussed. What does this look like and what might you do to respond? I'll take it. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Christine. Um, we mentioned two. One was joke, joking. And one was on higher level of the work area to the whether it's female or male, um, um, just that the lower position might have it, might have a better perspective, and then um, in reaction, the the higher level worker um, most of the time might be in authority position, just use the silence. Absolutely, I think that's a great cue. Um, so thinking about a situation or a dynamic where it's maybe an informal, right? Or maybe it's a lunch hour or something like that. Um, somebody makes an inappropriate comment or joke or something along those lines. And the person who's, who's maybe the, with authority in that group is, it makes, is just using silence to acknowledge that that was and maybe an inappropriate or uncomfortable situation. Absolutely. Yes? Uh, in a group project, like a uh, guy being very dismissive of a uh, girl, but I like, like, what do you do? Because I don't know if anything you say to him will make him care. And then you can't just not assign him to group projects with women. That doesn't solve anything. I think I, that's a perfect observation. I think you're absolutely correct. You still continue to, to assign as you normally would. I think you just make the observation of like, hey, I've noticed this is how you engage with our female students in the class. And if you're uncomfortable having that conversation, I'm happy to have that conversation. Because a lot of what I do is still educational, right? It's, it's not that people are in trouble, it's like, hey, I wanna bring this to your awareness. For some folks, it may actually be like, I did not know I was doing that. For others, it may not be that light bulb moment. But then I have started, I've started to demonstrate the steps that I've taken to help address it that are not hurting it, and I continue to, to resolve or continue to move forward in my process to address that concern. Absolutely. One more. Intentionally misgendering people? Intentionally misgendering people. Uh, reality check. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
reaction would probably be to address the person to see if they actually are doing it intentionally. And if they are in the then reporting that. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's something that I've seen in classrooms as well is, uh, you know, if there's a, whether it's intentional or accidental, is a, a instructor just saying, you know, uh, to a student who says, oh yeah, um, well he said this, oh, so-and-so, she said this, yes, right? And just a subtle correction can work just as well. Um, but I do think being able to call attention to it and report it, particularly if an individual who is gender non-conforming continues to be called out in the classes that they have with that person. You may be teaching one class of theirs, but this might be occurring in multiple classes across their experience, and we want to be able to figure out how we can address that and help support them. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Corey. Yes. So, can y'all hear me? Am I holding this right? Perfect. <laughs> So relationship violence is a pattern of abusive behavior in which one partner gains or maintains power and control over another current or former intimate partner. This can include physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological actions or even threats of actions that can influence the other person to feel unsafe. So a couple of these controlling behaviors might be like, where are you right now? Who are you with? What are you doing? Like, they need to know every moment of the day what's going on in your life. There can be belittling and name calling. Maybe it's physical and there's the pretty easy to identify physical things like shoving, punching, kicking, and then sexual abuse such as unwanted touching or engaging in sexual acts that they don't want to do. So, one thing, because I always interrupt. Um, the some of the relationship violence may also be really subtle, um, and so yeah, we have the obvious ones um, that that Corey mentioned. But the other thing to think about too are the not so subtle ones. It might be the like grabbing someone's arm and pinching them, right? You may not notice that, but at the dinner table, somebody's having a conversation, and all of a sudden they stop. Like, what's going on? That's that might be odd. Those are harder to notice, but they're still there and things to pay attention to. Sorry. Yeah, it could even be a look, like you're at dinner with your friends and one of them says something and you just see the other one give them this really domineering look of like, I'm upset with what you just said. That could be a sign that relationship violence is happening. So again, we're gonna give you a chance to talk about this amongst yourself. What are some of those other observable signs that you might see or encounter in your classroom or out in the campus community? And how might you respond to those? Think about this, yeah, in your work context. Is it in the classroom? Is it in your office hours? What might you observe in your role? Go. This is very subtle. Yeah. In relationship, it can be like sometimes someone can be sometimes because they're sharing everything. Uh, especially a husband and wife, so, so intimate. It's so deep to know, yeah, it's, it's, you might not be able to say like just one time like this and then you can, you can you know, say it like exactly what it is. I think I'm just much more quiet. Yeah. <laughs> All right, does anyone want to share some of those? 
some of the signs that you might see or how you respond? We're talking about because we're both going to be uh, TAs for lab. Um, and at least in my experience, it's fairly uncommon to have like two people that happen to be in a relationship in the same lab. Um, so the one that um, we came up with that was probably what we see the most of is on the cell phone. Uh, if somebody's in lab and texting a whole bunch, which they really shouldn't be paying attention to. Anyways, but then it's like you can tell it's not happy stuff. It's like they're getting a lot of it, or they get a phone call, they got the hall, and there's a bunch of screaming and <laughs> yelling at the other person. Um, as far as how you want us to deal with that, I mean, my first response is usually uh, put the cell phone away. It shouldn't be out. But, but how, how would you so, one of the things that I like to say is Vandal Care is super amazing. It's through the Dean of Students office. So, like, any concerns that you have for yourself, a colleague, a student, and you're not quite sure what's going on, but you want someone to check in on them, you can submit a Vandal Care report, and one of our case managers will talk to them. So, it could be, like, I've noticed they get a lot of texts and phone calls during lab, and I'm just really worried about them. Would you mind checking in on them and giving them some resources? It could be as simple as that, because a lot of the times with relationship violence, you might know one of the people, but not the other. And so you just want to make sure that they're getting the resources that they need in that moment. And relationship violence can be tricky, too, because um, your, your outreach or involvement, like let's say somebody's waiting outside class every, every lab period, they're waiting for them, or every time they get a message, they go, oh, you know, and like they're getting anxious and like tired and like what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, it might be it might be that your involvement might actually escalate a situation later for them. And so, I some, tend to be try to use hands free as possible and see if it resolves itself. Yeah. Um, by the next lab. Absolutely, and I, I think that's that's a great approach to take because. Simply because it could also be like like I do, and I love my mother dearly, but every time she texts me and I'm at work, I'm like, oh, Mom, you know I'm working, like, come on. Um, and so they, it could be a variety of different reasons that manifest and look similar to relationship violence, but they might be a little bit different. So that's why the Vandal Care Report can be a great resource. You see this happening, you're like, hey, every class, every class, every lab, I, you know, they're they're using their phone. I've had this conversation with them. They've said that they can't let their phone be away, they can't be away from their phone or whatever it is. Because sometimes that checking in is a control mechanism. That like, if you don't respond within 30 sec seconds, I know you're cheating on me. If you don't send me a picture that's current of where you are, I know you're with somebody else. Yeah. Those sorts of things are very manipulative and that's why people feel the pressure to sometimes have their phone on them. Can because, you do the vandal care thing? Uh, is it enough, I mean, all of <laughs> Is it anonymous? Uh, Vandal Care can be anonymous, absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. So things can be submitted anonymously through Vandal Care, and when, when the Dean of Students case managers reach out, often what they do is they'll say, like, hey, we received a concern or a report from a member in our community. It's very broad, very generic, very vague. We're not trying to necessarily out people who are reporting concerns. That being said, it's always helpful to have your information in case they need to follow back up and go, hey, um, we have some other questions for you about what you've observed, that sort of thing. I see a question. So if uh, a partner is going through someone's phone, is it like well disguised enough that it's about it? Does it like say like academic concern? Or like if I put in this report and someone's going through the phone, is it going to make the situation worse? It has the, so that's a great yeah. question. If you are knowing, if you're aware or have that concern that they might be going through their phone, put that in the care report. Because the NEA students can adjust how they respond in outreach in order to address that concern. Similarly for um, OCRI, when we are dealing with stalking cases and we know somebody has access or we're concerned they might have access to their email, um, I have seen emails go out going, hey, we wanted to follow up with you about your academic request. Please schedule a meeting with the NEA students. And so we can keep it very broad, vague, and benign. Um, and I, I, I don't yeah. know if Corey has anything else to add. No, I no. think you covered family care and what the name of students office does really well. Sorry, I don't work there, but. <laughs> but you've been here longer. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, so, so I know like with a phone is somewhat physical, they can kind of tell, but like 
I know you said previous say in, for the looks, you know, like one was sharing something, the other one doesn't want them to share. So to, I feel like that could be tricky because there could be things that one person thought, oh, if this was just supposed to be kept between us, and then you started sharing it with other people. So I need to make say something so you, I guess not to stop you from sharing, but just hey, I would prefer that you don't do that. So to what extent would you could like? That it's just communication between them versus that it becomes like violence that because if i have like say two students sitting in front of me talking for whatever classwork or whatever but then one started saying oh yeah th that they happen to be a couple and say we yeah this weekend we did so and so and the other person said give them a look say hey i don't want like my ta to know what i did this weekend you know so like to what extent would you have to not necessarily step that would report but like it's a hard question to answer, so I'm going to give you the best response I can, which is, um, to some extent, trust your gut. Hmm. And so the, you know, the first time or two that it happens, right, like maybe one time it happens, that's it, right? They were partying that weekend, they didn't want you to know, they got high over in Washington, because it's the only place it's legal, but why I? Um, <laughs> and they, they, they're like, I don't want my TA to know that. Yeah, exactly. um, so if it's a one-off thing, it may not be something that falls within this category that you have to report. But if you know that it becomes a habitual thing and you're like, this just this just makes me feel a little uncomfortable or there's something odd going on, sometimes we reach out. If, you know, somebody reports something, they're like, this sounds weird. We reach out and they go, oh my gosh, that's so, I appreciate somebody was concerned, but that's not, this is what this was about. And it's more often when those situations that are nothing get reported and we follow up, people are actually very grateful that somebody took enough time to care. So I don't think there's a lose-lose a lose opportunity to report, but you can also go with what's going on in your gut. So, continuing on, stalking is defined in our policies as engagement and of course a conduct directed at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear for their safety or the safety of people around them or to suffer some emotional distress as a result of those behaviors. Um, this one is really big because 18 to 24 year olds, which is the age of the majority of our college students, are at highest risk to be victims of stalking. And in fact, about half of victims of stalking report that they were stopped before the age of 25. So keeping an eye out for these signs is incredibly important in the work that you do, and it can show up in your work, and you'll have a chance to discuss that amongst yourselves. Um, so some of these are like the calling and texting repeatedly. Some of them are sending gifts or maybe stealing things of yours just to get you to interact with them in some way or capacity. And a lot of these can sound like things you might do if you like someone. Like you might show up to parties in hopes that you'll see them. Or you might send them a text every day to be like, hey, how are you doing? Because you want to interact with them. It constitutes stalking when that's unwanted. And so if someone tells you to stop, you stop. And if, even if they don't say to stop, but it's pretty obvious they're not into it, like they're avoiding you or they're not texting you back, those might be signs not to do it. And so this might show up in your own lives, it might show up in your students' lives, and we're gonna give you a chance to think about some of the behaviors that you might observe. I really want you to take time to think about what might you observe in someone who's experiencing stalking, like someone who is the target of that behavior, because a lot of times we can notice those signs of like the person who's doing the harm. But think about the signs you might see in the person receiving that harm. And then, what? how can you be a resource to either the person receiving the harm or even the person who's doing the harm? Because sometimes they don't realize it. And go. Well, <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. Like, you know, this, yeah. What kind of thing so, you know, it creates a lot of anxiety. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And 
It could be a single stuff and she used to work with the design stuff. Like getting text on the phone, or press the phone, and like all things up at her. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, pretty obvious that when someone does, it's not into it. Even in friendship, or like relationship more, like it would be pretty obvious. Like before stopping, you know, if that that is into it, it would be obvious. Like asking that, like it's, it's still, you know, yeah. yeah. We want to make sure we get to everything today. So would anyone like to share what they discussed? I would think that a behavior um, of the target would be nervousness, maybe always looking around the room to see if that person is there. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to respond to that, maybe pull them aside after class and let them know what resources are available if they feel fearful. Um, to the so maybe body language and proximity. So if somebody sits down, the other person leaves immediately, goes into a room, same thing. Absolutely. Le leaving the space that that other person enters on a regular basis, yeah. It's not another hand. Yeah. Uh, one that we had was like, Oh, we want to be in a group with them for group projects when it's clearly the other person is not interested or is trying to get out of it. Oh yeah, or you have somebody coming to you and saying, can you please make sure that this person is not in my group project next time? Um, those sort of things can be worth uh, noting. Um, and as far as, um, you know, kind of those, those, that person exhibiting the behavior, Curious, did any groups talk about that? What do you all think if you had a person exhibiting the behavior, what might you do to, to respond? Yeah. You're going to have to put on your big kid pants and talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> Uncomfortability is, uh, get used to it. It doesn't get better, but it is there. Um, but yeah, it might be a like, hey, I've noticed that you send a lot of text messages to this person, um, but they don't really get back to you as, like, What's, what's going on there? Um, and sometimes it's just having a really broad question to open the door to the conversation. Um, it, depending on the nature of the, the relationship, maybe this is a peer and you're like, hey, you are going to the bar every night of the week in the hopes of running into this person and it is, uh, it is kind of getting weird. Uh, I don't know if you know that it's coming across that way, but I wanted you to be aware that that's how it looks to me. And sometimes those are awkward, awkward conversations. Yeah. Um, sorry, Corey, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think that's good. I tend to be pretty direct, and I'll just be like, why are you always here? Like, you don't have class in this building. What are you doing in this space? If they're, like, showing up outside of classes. But that's just me, because I'm like, why? what are you doing here? Do you need me? Like, it could just be, like, not even addressing why are you here all the time. Be like, I've noticed you here a lot. Do you... Do you need help finding something? Can I be a source, like a resource for you? What do you need? And then sometimes they'll be like, oh, no, now they know this, and <laughs> I'll feel awkward coming back here. So just little things like that. I, I have a follow-up question. So if in case uh, the both, of, both of them are in your class, so if, right now what you're saying was the person was not in your class, but what if he is, or if like, he or she is in your and how how can you react to that? If so, you're you think that there's a stalking going on, maybe like they're they're joining the class because they want to be with that person. Um, join the class, or they they were in the class and now they started. Okay, I think if there's something of a concern like that, it's important to report it because what we'll do is we'll reach out to the person that you think is experiencing the behavior, and we're gonna go, hey. We just want to talk to you, see how things are going with you, um, and it creates an opportunity for them to engage with us to then address the concern. So we have things called supportive measures that we can put in place. It might be things like, hey, just don't talk to one another. It might be removing them from your section and putting them in another section. It might be putting them in a different residence hall. It might be creating um, a safety plan. It might be 
providing safe walks so that when they go from one class to another, there's kind of a person in the vicinity that helps. So those are things that, if they're in the same class, report it, and then we can help work with that individual to figure out what safety plans are best for them, because sometimes how we address it has to be cautious um, to be able to ensure that there, if there's a safety component to that, that we're, we're being thoughtful about that. Is that question in the back? Should you, pretty much as a rule of thumb, just report all of it because you have no way of knowing if there is a safety component? I feel like just confronting people isn't really a good idea. <laughs> Uh, I think that's very wise. <laughs> I think that's very wise. So here's the hard part, right? You all are going to be in these situations. We are not. Um, you're going to have a better read on the context. You're going to have a better read on the people, your relationships with those individuals, what you've observed in the dynamics of others. And so you may have a certain level of comfort or understanding of the context to feel comfortable to go and be like, hey, you're showing up, what's going on? You may also not. And you may also feel like, this is weird, I'm not sure what to do. So I always prefer folks err on the side of caution and report. And again, nothing, no, reporting isn't, isn't necessarily a bad thing and it doesn't, many folks when we reach out are appreciative of the support and that somebody observed something and took note and wanted to make sure that they got help, even if there wasn't anything to help with. Um, so there, this is always a hard and complex topic because things can be the worst case scenario. Things can also be absolutely nothing. And unfortunately, we're not gonna be in your shoes. The other thing you can always do is call me and go, hey, this has happened. Um, I'm not sure what to do. Should I report it? And I can walk you through some steps. I can walk you through some options and give you some choices based on the specific facts that are being presented. All right, we only have a couple more minutes, so I'm gonna quickly move through the rest of what we have before we have to leave. But you all have been asking great questions. Yes, wonderful. That's why we continue to just answer those. And so our next definition, this is the last definition you're gonna to get today, it's sexual violence, which is a form of sexual harassment. And this is any physical non-consensual um, relationship that's happening without the person's consent. So it could be they can't give consent because of alcohol or drugs, or maybe they have a disability that impacts their ability to give that consent. This includes rape, sexual assault, sexual battery, and sexual coercion. Um, consent is the key word to that, and we were gonna have you like discuss amongst yourselves how you would define consent, but I'm gonna leave this with you. U of I has a lot of different consent policies, well, consent definitions, all with the same intended purpose, um, but today I want you to leave here and think about like how would you define consent? What does that look like? Um, and then how might a student with these issues present? Do you want to say anything for me? Nope, that's perfect. That's perfect. So, also what helps and what hurts we really want to make sure that if a student does come to you and they disclose a situation of relationship or sexual violence to you, that you respond in a supportive way. So you want to listen non-judgmentally. You want to avoid any placing of blame or guilt. Um, so this means that regardless of whether you're speaking with a student who is making the report or the student who has been accused of any misconduct, you want to give them the same care and concern and give them access to the same resources. So your demeanor should reflect this care. Don't cross your arms. Don't lean away. Please, please, please don't check your phone while someone is talking to you about one of these issues. Mm -hmm. And you want to do things like giving them your full attention and leaning in, making eye contact. Um, you want to avoid phrases like, I understand or I know how that feels, because although you may be trying to comfort them and help them, it can also invalidate their experience. These are just some general yeah. rules in terms of body language, so the other thing to take into consideration is some cultural components. Sorry, you're probably going to get into that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm rushing through really quickly. Uh, so yeah, so <laughs> the, the cultural components to think about is, right, like maybe eye contact is not appropriate. Maybe, um, you know, that, that closed door is not appropriate, right? Like think through, there might be some different considerations. These are some general rules of thumb, but they're, these are also all tied to specifically American culture, which may not be 
translatable. Absolutely. So everyone, take your phone out real quick. Please scan the QR code on this, because I don't have time to get into all of the things that you should do to support your students. But RAIN is a national anti-sexual violence organization, and this QR code is going to take you to a page that talks about all the ways that you can support someone who might be disclosing this to you, and what listening non-judgmentally looks like, and then the probing and supportive questions. They're going to give you questions to avoid, and questions that you should use instead so that I do not have to walk through them. Um, and just in that term of offering both the person who is reporting the situation and might be accused of misconduct, you want to make sure that you don't take actions that appear disciplinary in nature. So don't like ban someone from your class or anything like that. You really, like there are interim steps that can be taken through the Dean of Students Office and OCRI, so you're going to want to contact us before you make any decisions of that nature. And the most important thing is to ensure autonomy. Give these people choices where they're able. So don't say like, oh, you need to take a day off or contact the police on their behalf because they might not want to talk to the police. They might not want to go to the criminal, through the criminal process. So you shouldn't be making those decisions. Instead, let them decide, do I want to take a day off or do I want to continue going to class for some normalcy or do I want to engage with the police or do I want to keep it to U of I? And then take care of yourselves. Always share resources with them. You should not be their only source of support. That's a lot to put on you. And you already have so much to do as graduate students here. So make sure you're sharing those resources and taking care of yourself in these moments. Which, by the way, we'll have information on that back table, which has all of those resources. Yes. Um, so it talks and it walks through how do you address um, and respond in the moment, what are the resources that are confidential and non-confidential, and the nice thing is that this is perforated, so you can tear it in half. You have one half for yourself that helps guide you through the response, and you have the other half that you can give to the student um, or the individual to let them have, so that they can have that resource and those options available as well. So you will actually get a, 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 a version of, oh no, we changed the training, no, take that back. Um, so we want to make sure that you just know this, this air model is written out in these air cards, in these, in these fold cards in the back. You're assessing immediate health and safety needs. You're informing them of your obligations to report. First and foremost, it's best to do that before you get a disclosure. Put it on your syllabus. Make it as part of your, your housekeeping items in your first, in your first class. Um, let them know that you are a mandatory reporter. Then make sure you're getting them connected with resources and you're making sure that you're reporting that information ultimately to OCRI through the Vandal Care Form. All right, so here are the campus resources. You can take a picture, but I also have Katie Benoit Campus Safety Month flyers in the back. It goes through a lot of upcoming events that are happening on campus, and the back side of that has all of these resources, and if they have an asterisk next to their name, that means they're confidential. So if a student goes to that resource, they don't actually have to report like you do. And then I already told you what the Violence Prevention Programs does. The bad news as a whole, it's happening here. We're pretty in line with those national statistics. So one in four women and one in 11 men. And then it's even higher for transgender and gender non-conforming people. So we know that people are experiencing this, but there's good news. We have lots of resources on campus. We are two of them. We have a bystander intervention program called Green Dot, which will help give you tools and empower you as a bystander so that when you see potentially harmful situations, the goal of this training is to figure out ways that work for you to respond. Whether you directly do something, you delegate it to someone like Aaron, or maybe you just distract people because you see a potentially harmful situation, you're like, I'm gonna spill a drink, or I'm gonna set off my car alarm. It goes through all of those wonderful things. And we have some of those as a part of Katie Benoit Campus Safety Awareness Month. So on the flyer, if you scan the QR code, it'll take you to a page that talks about all the different things where you can sign up for a faculty and staff training on September 13th if you'd like to. We already talked about that, and here's our information. Excellent. <laughs> we will leave you to get your next session. We appreciate everyone's time and attention. Again, um, we'll leave this information up here. Take a photo if you have any questions. We'll leave information on the back um, so that you can uh, reach out to us if you have any questions. But we thank you, and good luck with the rest of your day.